first met at the University of Michigan. We were there as musical theater majors, as like actors, singers, dancers, which is sort of sad and hilarious. <laughs> but uh, we were there uh, uh, to be performers. Uh, and we were both, we sort of became friends first. We were in ballet class together. We were the two worst people in the ballet class. Yeah, so it's we a would very unfortunate situation. Hide behind each other to not be seen by the ballet teacher because we were like the worst dancers yeah. in the class. Um, so we sort of became friends that way. And then I think um, sometime during our freshman year, as is wont to happen, sort of, we, uh, we found ourselves in a practice room, in a music practice room, like they have in all music schools. And we were sort of just messing around and not sort of intentionally planning to do anything. We're like two guys with like ADD or ADHD, one of the two, and we just started writing songs together. And uh, from from then, we continued to do it. Yeah, I had always played piano, and Bench had sort of written songs uh, previously in high school and stuff. So we just it sort of organically happened, uh, and we started writing for no other purpose than just to write, I guess. We wrote uh, maybe like two or three songs yeah. that year. And then our sophomore year, we were cast in two of the worst roles that you can get cast in in our school musical. So yeah, <laughs> it was City of Angels and Justin was cast as an Asian backup dancer slash coroner. Obviously. And I was uh, cast as the man with camera. So I had like one line and and our moms were gonna fly out to see us in this school production. It was like really embarrassing that we had like no parts. So we were like, you know what? We wrote a couple songs, so maybe we could write a couple more. We could create a show. Right, so, we'll write our own show. Yeah. Since we can't seem to get good parts in any other ones. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so we wrote our own show, and it, it became um, the show that we wrote called Edges, um, which you know we wrote our sophomore year of college. And it was yeah. really great timing, because it was the same year that um, Facebook and YouTube and all these things sort of started. So uh, we wrote this, this song cycle, and then it kind of went online, and it, I think, spoke to a lot of people who were our age. and and a sort of millennial audience, and, and we were like, well, maybe we'll be songwriters now instead. Awesome. We've been pursuing it ever since. Yeah. I think we're really inspired by however the characters speak and however the characters sing. So it's been our intention to try to write in different, many different kinds of worlds, and those worlds and those characters will dictate musical style musical and style. lyrical style. Yeah. And so, you know, James and the Giant Peach, which, you know, has a lot of British characters and also fantastic it's sort of characters. sort of whimsical um, story. You know, we can use then any kind of um, musical reference because, you know, who is to say how a six-foot centipede is supposed to sing? We right. can determine that. Why can't that. an earthworm big, do a big saucy Latin number? Right. You know I mean? Well, we say he could. Raul Dahl would have <laughs> said he could, and we say he could. Right, you know but I mean? a show like Dogfight, for instance, which is set in the 1960s in San Francisco, is going to have a lot of folk influence is and uh, it, you know it's sort of a mixture between folk and musical theater yeah, and, and it wants to feel like it's at least honoring the sonic world of that era yeah and so I think we we like to tell stories and we like to use music to tell stories and ultimately whatever the character and whatever the world is dictating we try to figure out if we can you know figure out how to marry music with character I think each each style of writing sort of has its challenges with uh, with an uh, adaptation. You're taking some source material and you're putting it into song, putting it into story. So, so it, there's something, there's a backbone that you can sort of rely upon. And there's something you know, okay, this worked in some form. So it's, it's about picking the moments from that story or creating your own if you need to. Um, with, with something original, it's sort of easier and harder at the same time. And it's easier because we can say what we want to say. There's nothing binding, there's nothing, there's no, there are no, there's no structure to it really. We can say what we want to say, but it also means you're having to create something from nothing and create a, create a story. The songs and edges that we wrote are all sort of story songs. Each one is its own self-contained thing, which is great, um, but it's also easy to do in a way because you can t sing about anything and everything. With something like James and the Giant Peach, it still needs to be a full song moment, but we can't tell the character's entire story in one song, because then the show would be over after one song. Right, a lot of the, the example that we use in Edges is that they're all kind of like 11 o'clock numbers. Like, you meet a character and you see the entire it's like character a to Z. journey. You know what I mean? you see, yeah. It's like, I'm a kid from Indiana, and by the end of it, it's like, I'm gonna go out and conquer the world. It's like their whole story encapsulated in one song moment. Right, but in a musical, you know, you only have to get the character from this place to this place, you know, and it's a smaller increment as opposed to, you know, this chunk. Um, and in a song cycle, it goes from here to there, right. and you have to tell the entire story. So it's just a different kind of writing. How to start the song is always, I think, the hardest thing, mm -hmm. um, for me at least. As I think usually what we do in terms of figuring out a song is we think, what's the hook idea? 
So you know, we, we liken it to like a, it's like a five paragraph essay that you had to do in high school. It's like, what's the thesis statement that yeah. you keep coming back to? And once you figure out what that hook idea is, then you can build everything around it. And then always, then the next hardest part, I think, is how do you what's start the, way the song? In. Yeah, and, 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 and the goal is to always try to do something that does grab you, that, that catches you not just at the start of the story, the, like some, not something as general, but maybe just, you know, if you can if you can start the song just like that much into the story mm. that the people that audience needs to catch up you just need to a make little bit, somebody lean, in lean forward. So they you know what I mean? Keep so, listening. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. I don't think we consciously think about the audience needing to relate to every single song that we that we write. However, hopefully, we're choosing moments that are relatable and are universal. And even in a very specific story, even when you're writing about. Uh, uh, some specific moment, like James the Giant Peach, when he's singing the song Middle of a Moment, he sort of has this opportunity to go into the peach, and is he going to do it or not? He's there. He's stuck in this moment and feels like he has no other options. He sees an option. Is he brave enough to do it? Um, but that is, hopefully, a universal thing for lots of people to relate to. So I think we don't consciously think about it, but hopefully if we're choosing our moments correctly or, or right, in our shows, we're going to at least have a good chunk of moments that feel like, oh, I have never been in that exact situation, but I've been in a situation like that. I can relate to that moment. Yeah, and the thing that's great about musical theater, and I think writing in general, is like specificity is the key to universality. Like, if you pick a really specific moment, you know, and you tell the very specific story, people will find their universal They'll truth. They'll find in their it. story in it. And so, even but, if, but if you write a song that's sort of like a general wash of like, mm. I'm excited and I don't know what's going to happen, it's and not like, specific. People enough. don't actually relate. To, you'd think, oh, right. it's universal. Everyone relates to that. Yeah. No one really relates to that mm. because they want to hear your interesting story and then they'll, they'll project onto it their own cir uh, circumstances or experiences. Yeah, for middle of a moment particularly, I mean, the verses are very specific to James and James's predicament, right? Mm -hmm. He's trying to escape uh, these evil ants and they call him a liar and he's trying to get out of it. But when you get to the chorus, the we're chorus able emotion. to make something that is more universal. So it really can double as sort of a metaphor for getting out of a dark place in your life. It can be about getting through a depressive state. It can be really anything about, you know, moving through something that's really hard. And so the verses we use to use a kind of lyric that's very specific to the show, but the chorus can be more universal, and that's the way that we try to balance it in that song. <laughs> you know, it's funny. The story of uh, Caught in the Storm is that we had been contacted to potentially write for Smash uh, and, uh, by the showrunner. And he said, you know, we, we'd love to hear your style, what you might do for a show like this. We knew they wanted contemporary pop sounding theater songs. And so we were thrilled that we got called, but he said, we'd love to hear what you might write for it. So as a first assignment, could you, it was basically an audition. And they said, you know, can you write a song? And, the, and it was, I mean, we love, we love these guys, but the, the, uh, the prompt was sort of all over the place. It was really funny. It was like, it can be a love song or, or love like song maybe a love to song the city. to the city or, or like to like, someone really wanting something. We're like, okay, uh, talk okay. about like specificity and universality. Yeah. So we so we thought a little bit about this character and we what we knew coming up in in that the second season of Smash was she was going to be uh, Captain McSmee's character was going to be involved with somebody who had battled with some drug issues, had some sort of personality issues, and so we thought about okay, someone in that situation would be singing about being involved in this tumultuous relationship that. I think it's a universal thing, which is, you know, I, I want it, but I shouldn't want it. I can't live without it, but I can't live with it. That sort of feeling. So we decided to just write a song that captured that thing. So we said, that's the ballpark of what this character would feel. But it was just an audition. And so we sent it in. And we didn't hear back, and we didn't hear back. Mm -hmm. And then we got a call from the showrunner. He said, hey, um, just want to let you know, guys know, congratulations, uh, Caught in the Storm will be in episode two of season two. We're, We're like, like, wait, wait we, we skipped the step here. <laughs> like, uh, well, we, we didn't, if, that, if it was for that episode, we could write yeah. it more for that. He's like, no, 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 it works great. We're putting it in, whatever. We're like, uh, OK, cool. great. Yeah, <laughs> so that was sort of like a, a, a crash course or like you know, quick indoctrination into the Smash world. But it was uh, really cool. Out in the end, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, oh, I was oh. going to say, and, and in trying to figure out, like we, we are always trying to balance, um, for particular projects, how to balance pop and musical theater. And, mm -hmm. and we feel like because we love pop music, but we also are theater guys and theater writers, it's really about you know balancing those two worlds. So both the songs, Middle of a Moment and Caught in the Storm, they both are really heavy in terms of what uh, an overall metaphor is for the character, but the character is still singing it very specifically, like especially in Caught in the Storm, to somebody, so that there's really an other that you're speaking to, and that's what sort of makes it very theatrical, that 
character is wanting something from another character, mm -hmm. and therefore it activates it, and it makes it a very, it, it makes it a more active song and, and more playable on stage. So we're always trying to balance those two worlds when we try to create something. Well, I would just say that, you know, you you, you don't you don't ever think that you can do it until you do it. You know, so much of it is just creating the first thing. I'm really inspired. There's this, um, I, I, do, I say this all the time, and it probably annoys <laughs> Justin, but like there's this Ira Glass, okay. there's, there's this Ira Glass <laughs> quote that I find very inspiring, which he basically says that anyone who has taste will hate the work that they actually create initially because you're not a professional, right? Mm -hmm. So like you look at a blank piece of paper and you write something and you think it's garbage, but that's actually a really reassuring sign because if you look at what you create initially and you think it's terrible, that means that your taste level is better than your ability level. Mm -hmm. And it means that you'll keep working if you look at it and say it's garbage, then how do I make it better? How do I make it better? And your taste level will dictate, okay, I need to redo it, I need to redo it, I need to redo it. And eventually your ability level will approach your taste level, yeah. but you need to realize that if you write something that sucks the first time, that's a great sign, because it means that there's part of your mind, this judgmental part of your mind that knows that it can be better. And if you stick with it long enough, the judgmental part of your mind will make it better and better and better, and then eventually, three years later, it won't be amateurish, it'll be something that's more substantial, and you just keep working and keep working and, and whittle away until you get something great. I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think like sort of along those same, sort of similar lines of, of just, uh, just not being afraid to create and to do it, I think is, is to make opportunities for yourself and to not wait for someone. I know for us, when we first came to New York City and we were uh, sort of shopping around our Edge's CV, I think we were doing it thinking that someone would hear it and be like, oh, brilliant, I wanna pay you a million dollars to write another show for me. <laughs> and, uh, and that wasn't the case at all. It was really like a way for people to know who we were and mm -hmm. it was a good first marketing tool, but then everyone was sort of like, that's great, so what else are you working on? What's your next thing? Mm -hmm. And it was up to us to start. And, and the way it often works, I think, is as soon as you do start, for us, I mean, as soon as we started working on something of our own, then other things started to come our way. But I think it takes like you doing that first thing yourself. And, and, and right now, we are in a, an era that it's so, so possible to create things for yourself and to put things out there, whether it's on YouTube or whatever social media. I mean, as long as it's good and as long as you've thought about it and it's, you're being careful and cautious about it. But we're, there's so many resources for us to create things on our own and put them out there. And that's the way that most things are getting made right now. I mean, mm -hmm. everything from film to TV to, to, to musicals to, to songwriters. Uh, so I think, you know, not waiting for opportunities to come your way, but creating them yourself. And I think that begets other opportunities that do come your way. Yeah, it's, I think it's just approaching everything like you're an entrepreneur and mm -hmm. being a songwriter now more than ever is about, it's like we have a startup essentially. We are entrepreneurs right. and we are, we have to make the thing and no one's gonna tell you to make it, nobody's gonna pay you to make it, you have to just make it yourself and then pitch it and make, you know, hope that the world wants to see it. But it's really up to you to, to begin to create. And you know, circling back, it's not being afraid to create initially and right. knowing that it'll keep getting better when you do. Right.